interesting. So um, then, uh, our, so we had geology. Now we're going to have archaeology. <laughs> and so um, uh, we're so delighted to have um, Dr. Jess Robinson here. He's the Vermont State archaeologist, the second one ever, and he has a great affinity for Mount Independence and has done, has crawled all over it and has done great studies about the uh, here and he knows a lot about the whole history of the, and the archeology span of Vermont and especially the Champlain Valley. And he's very busy, so we're really pleased that you can come today. Thank you so much, Jess. Well, thanks, Elsa, and, and uh, I really appreciate being here and I really uh, appreciate uh, uh, the previous talk and, and Helen's discussion was amazing and a, and a great compliment to what we're about to talk about. And um, I didn't, I am not a Revolutionary War historian or historic archaeologist by training. I've had to learn a lot of that since uh, getting on the, on the job here, although I did do some work here and at Chimney Point prior. Um, so I, I, I will concentrate on what I thought might complement uh, the, the experts in the room, which is uh, the pre-contact or, or prehistoric archaeology of the Champlain Valley and try to, try to focus on Mount Independence uh, where I can. And one of those areas where I will in the, in the latter half of the talk be sort of um, referencing Mount Independence is precisely what one of the uh, folks talked about, which is the church that uh, outcrops here and elsewhere, and I'm glad that you're still here because um, <laughs> please jump in and, um, and uh, correct me uh, or, or um, add to whatever I'm about to say, but I heard you might sneak out, so as a prelude, before I even show anything, I will say that the chert on the mount is uh, what is called a nodular chert, meaning that um, the silica is, flows through the limestone and then gets trapped in cavities there. And over a long period of time, those cavities fill with silica-rich solution, and then they solidify, and the processes by which they solidify, you know, I, I guess heat and pressure and time, and they become these nodules. And the nodules can be, I've seen nodules that are, you know, football size or smaller, and nodules can be huge, you know, the size of Volkswagens or, or, or bigger. But they're, they're solution that was trapped in cavities. And there's a major quarry of that on uh, Mount Independence. We don't know how big it once was, uh, largely because it was mined for at least the last probably 10,000, 9,500 years by Native Americans. And then it was mined during the Revolutionary War for gun flints. Um, and so what, what the original extent of the outcrops and the quality of the stone was, we don't know. It is not the only place where this chert outcrops. Um, you know, geologically very similar outcrops that were formed through the same processes occur in Whitehall um, and in Fort Anne. And archaeologists, not being geologists, call them all different cherts, and it's taken a long time to realize that they're essentially just diff different outcrops of the same chert. Um, but then there's another chert. Uh, there's only two outcrops of, of really well-known chert in Vermont. There's, there's another outcrop of this stuff in Mount Independence um, up towards Sh Charlotte, too, but it's smaller. We don't know how much Native Americans actually utilized it. Um, and they were probably finding smaller little micro beds of chert throughout the Champlain Valley. Uh, but we, we don't know of any big quarries other than Mount Independence in Vermont. And then there's another one up in St. Albans called um, Hathaway Chert, uh, near and around Hathaway Point, which was formed by a completely different process. Um, and is, a, is, is, is geologically very similar to the major Native American chert quarries down in, in the Hudson Valley, um, and was formed during the Taconic orogeny, which I have no idea what that is. That was that, that <laughs> right. those volcanoes? Right. When those collided, that was the Taconic orogeny. Yes. <laughs> so all the Hudson Valley, um, all the Hudson Valley quarries were formed during the Taconic orogeny, as was this, um, this uh, St. Albans quarry, but the St. Albans quarry then w underwent a lot of deformation, and then so the chert got all cracked up and then was re sort of um, solidified together. 
So it's what geologists I understand call a melange. Um, but the, but the, the chert looks quite different, it feels quite different, um, and, it, and it underwent um, significant, uh, you know, it, it, was, it, it, it um, was used in different ways by Native Americans. And so I'm gonna talk about that in a little in the second half of my talk. The first half of my talk, though, I will be focusing on um, the other thing that was mentioned, which is uh, the uh, end of the last ice age um, when um, the glaciers had receded north of what's Vermont um, and um, uh, right around 13, 14,000 years ago. Uh, and the, the events that would come to be the, 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 the first landscape that humans entered into Vermont was Hurtland. And we call this earliest period of native uh, or human habitation in Vermont the Paleo-Indian period. Um, in the Northeast, it dates from roughly 13,000 to about 9,500 years ago. And this is just, uh, an, oh, there we go. This is just an artist's uh, re reconstruction of what um, it would have looked like at, the, at the, the, the height of the last pulse of the last ice age, probably around 24,000 years ago. This up here, you can see is sort of the Nova Scotia area, the continental shelf was, was largely exposed, but covered in ice down to roughly Long Island. And again, this mile of ice overlay, in some cases, uh, the region that we're on now. But it began to melt, and, uh, and this would be the last uh, melt. Uh, the previous um, ice age had gone through pulses of melting and, and retreating ice, uh, and this would be the last uh, for this particular ice age. This is what just another, uh, you know, more simplistic illustration would have looked like. The large ice sheet covering, you know, what's now much of northeastern North America, the Laurentide ice sheet, and then a Pacific ice sheet called the Cordilleran. And locally, um, right around uh, 13,500 years ago or so, um, you know, rounding, this is what the, the, uh, the newly exposed landscape looked like. All this meltwater was filling uh, the major basins in the, in the New England region and in the Great Lakes region. Um, in, in, in the Champlain Valley, there was uh, a huge glacial lake called Lake Vermont, which at its height was actually confluent with another glacial lake called Glacial Lake Albany, um, essentially forming one giant lake at its, at, at its largest extent. Um, in the Connecticut River Valley, there was Glacial Lake Hitchcock, and then in the, uh, in the Great Lakes Basin, there was an enormous glacial lake called Glacial Lake Iroquois. And uh, right around 13,300 years ago, that sort of nick point between um, uh, Glacial Lake Iroquois and, and uh, Lake Vermont, Lake Albany, um, gave way. And um, uh, there was a catastrophic flood that um, sent water down the valley, blew out Lake Vermont, uh, Lake Albany, all the way out um, through Long Island Sound. I didn't, if I was giving a longer lecture just on the Paleo Indian period, I'd have a lot more slides. But basically, that emptied out, uh, you know, a couple hundred feet of Lake Iroquois, uh, uh, Lake Vermont, all the way down, drained. And, uh, you know, my colleague Stephen Wright, you know, once said, well, imagine sitting on top of Mount Philo and watching, you know, Lake Champlain drain 100 feet in a matter of days. That would be <laughs> what it would have looked like to have been there. Um, then Lake Vermont actually reformed, uh, but with a, a, a shorter dam around Whitehall again, filled again um, with, again, the melting glac uh, um, glacial meltwater. And um, then finally, uh, around um, 13,000 years ago, uh, the, the glacier that was holding seawater away from the, uh, from the glacial water uh, gave way. And um, uh, Lake Vermont drained again out of the Atlantic. But as was noted before, um, the, the lowlands of the Champlain Valley, because of isostatic rebound were, 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 or isostatic pressure, were compressed. So a lot of that low-lying area was lower than the Atlantic Ocean. Seawater ran in, and that began the tenure of the Champlain Sea, and right around uh, 13,000 years ago. And um, the Champlain Sea was in existence, although getting slowly shallow, shallower through time as, as isostatic rebound and, and uh, sea level changes globally um, slowly 
you know, caused the land to rebound again, seawater change to happen, until finally uh, it became a freshwater lake around 9,500, 9,000 years ago. So this is what uh, the area would have looked like around 11,800 years ago, just in the middle of the Champlain Sea period. Um, this, uh, this was, um, uh, you know, the southern arm of the Champlain Valley. Um, it, you know, the Champlain Sea at its maximum went into the Ontario lowlands and then out into the Atlantic, and then portions of the continental shelf were still exposed. And what we're interested in here is, is the southern arm, the Champlain Valley, uh, Vermont and New York. And uh, unlike the glacial lakes, which had very little uh, you know, organic or biotic activity in them, uh, the, the Champlain Sea, uh, as was noted, was uh, you know, filled with, with marine life. It's much like uh, off the coast of Labrador today, there were marine mammals, which I'll show in a minute. Um, there, were, there were fish, there were uh, mollusks, there was you know, a lot of um, microscopic marine life. It was just a thriving cold water marine environment. Um, just pictures of what it might look like. And um, for a paper I did a number of years ago, I aggregated what were then all of the radiocarbon dates of marine mammals that would have been found in the Champlain Sea. So I'll just read them through here. Harbor seal, bowhead whale, finback whale, ring seal, white whale, narwhal, walrus. All of these uh, have been found in Champlain Sea sediments. And the dates um, attest to uh, other geological um, indicators that suggest the Champlain Sea started right around 13,000 years ago and went uh, right uh, until about 10,000 or a little, little later. Um, and uh, recently, the, the Charlotte whale, uh, the state marine fossil, was actually radiocarbon dated um, to just almost exactly 13,000 years ago. So mm -hmm. it was probably there just at the start of the Champlain Sea. So getting back to what I'm more familiar with, which is uh, uh, native people and archaeology, um, uh, this, the start of the, the arrival of the Champlain Sea um, also coincided regionally with uh, the start of humans entering the region, the Paleo-Indian people. And you know, um, if you're not familiar with with uh, the, the native archaeology of this region, you, and you were you were thinking just sort of uh, casually or simplistically about it, you might think that these earliest people were were the you know the, had the most quote unquote simplistic or quote unquote primitive um, technologies, but that's actually not the case, at least when it comes to stone. Uh, native uh, Paleo Indians in in uh, in the Northeast and, and elsewhere in the continent actually um, were master craftsmen in stone, and they would and it, it's just particularly evinced in their spear points, um, which were often quite large, expertly um, what we call napped or flaked um, to a really uniform shape and morphology, and then once they achieved this shape with this often ribbon type flaking going going down it. Um, they would take the central uh, channel off of um, uh, the middle of the point um, on both sides, typically, uh, and um, this flute or channel is, is a hallmark of the Paleo-Indian period, uh, not only in the Northeast, but actually everywhere across uh, uh, much of the continent from you know middle of, of, uh, of Central America all the way up to uh, the glacial ice sheet in Washington State or Nova Scotia uh, and across the continent. It's the only time uh, that we're aware of that native people did the same thing, made the same stone tool from one end of the continent to the other. And typical reconstructions of, of Paleo-Indian lifeways, again, across the continent and here in the Northeast in previous decades, have, have imagined them as sort of peripatetic wanderers, uh, hunting out big game. This is what a typical uh, you know, late 70s depiction of Northeastern Paleo-Indians would have, would have uh, was, was uh, drawn as, uh, you know, wearing uh, out on the cold tundra, wearing uh, caribou skins and hunting caribou, um, relying on these large terrestrial animals, if not caribou, then perhaps bison, if not bison, then perhaps mastodon or mammoth. By the way, this particular spear point was made for me um, uh, 
uh, I had a reconstruction made of it at Chimney Point, um, um, and uh, I wanted it precisely so I could show this uh, last reduction sequence. So he kept, or I kept, the last channel flake. And that chert is Hudson Valley chert from West Athens Hill. So, um, as I was saying, uh, as geologists were coming to understand the age of the Champlain Sea, which is not a long ago thing, it's really only in the last 15 years or so that people have gotten, uh, um, uh, through various techniques, gotten a suite of uh, accepted radiocarbon dates uh, to understand exactly the age of the Champlain Sea. And in previous decades, um, archaeologists were, became convinced that the Champlain Sea had already come and gone by the time the first humans had come in. So essentially they were coming into the lake more or less as, as it exists today. But now we know that's not the case. And um, our, our conversely, you know, on the right of this, you'll see all of um, the, uh, the northeastern Paleo-Indian radiocarbon dates. There have been no radiocarbon dated uh, Paleo-Indian sites in Vermont, but in, in, in neighboring states, we've developed a chronology and how spear points, even though they were these flut fluted spear points, changed through time throughout the Paleo-Indian period. And that's illustrated up the top uh, by Vermont spear points. So understanding this, that the age of the Champlain Sea, you know, about 15 years ago now, 20 years ago now, um, was, uh, you know, revised more recent, that it was potentially or was coeval with the Paleo-Indian period. My, my colleague John Crock and I were interested in, in if Paleo-Indians were even attracted to the Champlain Sea. Was it a reason to be here? Was it something that they thought about? Or were they more content to be walking out on the frozen uh, terrain um, hunting terrestrial mammals? And it, and it was at best an impediment to get where they needed to be. So we began um, a, a large survey of Paleo-Indian sites um, those that had been officially recorded in Vermont, but also those that you know were still um, in farmers' collections and, and elsewhere, and went about a couple of year period documenting these sites and mapping their locations and, and, and relevant information about the sites um, on various maps, which you know I've, I've added to over the years. So the so based upon the the styles of spear point that change through time, we can roughly bracket that the ages within the Paleo-Indian period. And the first, based upon uh, this style of, of uh, spear point, um, dates from about 12,900 to about 12,400 years ago. And I contend that people probably didn't move into the Champlain Valley um, in any real way until about 12,700 years ago, for various reasons, but a lot of it having to do with uh, you know, plant um, cover and you know the ability enough biomass for uh, people and animals to, to live in because obviously when the glaciers receded it, it takes time for pollen to spread north for plants to start growing for rivers to you know cut into their banks and and it's and um, to be stable enough to support a human population however small so um, this is a close-up with a LIDAR underlying um, a map of um, uh, the Champlain Sea at its maximum. And I, I worked uh, with um, uh, George Springston, from, uh, a Norwich geologist, who did uh, the, the fine mapping of the Champlain Sea at its maximum. Uh, we published a paper together a number of years ago. And, and this is that, his map. Um, uh, and the heat map um, is just the relative elevation. So higher elevation is in the grays. And what you see is there's this cluster of Paleo-Indian sites at the area where the Champlain Sea met uh, the Winooski River. So this, the Winooski River was bigger than it is today. As you can see, it was probably you know, somewhat estuarine-like. Um, and um, where it flowed in, you have this concentration of, uh, of Paleo-Indian sites. This is roughly where the box stores in Williston are today. Um, <laughs> And the biggest Paleo-Indian site yet known in Vermont is down here uh, on this sort of uh, tributary running out into, you know, uh, the shallow water, perhaps tidal flat type feature. It's just a close-up of that area. And in the 1990s, when it was excavated uh, by the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology Program, they were really stumped about 
why a paleo Indian site, let alone it's, it's huge, uh, would be on this sort of uh, exposed bedrock knoll, nowhere really near uh, any notable features. But now we know that it was on this on this trip, running out into these lower areas, out into the sea, was a really advantageous position, um, you know, to to encounter game going out to the sea to to take advantage of the the resources of the sea itself. So was that Williston? Williston, yes. So um, I'll get back to this in a minute, but um, at this site in Williston, we have. Uh, raw material that Paleo Indians were using that span roughly 850 uh, kilometers in straight line distance between the most distant quarries. We have local quartzite that outcrops uh, principally along the western spine of the Green Mountains, but there's a lot of boulders and cobbles of it all throughout the Champlain Valley. The top two rows are that Hudson Valley chert uh, around the Albany area. Uh, this red material down on the bottom left is uh, from Monsungan Lake in north central Maine. And then that yellow material down on the lower right is actually from uh, a, a quarry in uh, central Pennsylvania. So all of this material was transported either by uh, direct movement of Paleo Indians or potentially by trade and exchange uh, over a, a vast distance. The next period, uh, we have a very large Paleo Indian site um, where, um, uh, very similar to the Winooski, uh, where uh, the, the uh, Lamoille was flowing out into the Champlain Sea. Again, attesting to the importance of that sort of uh, freshwater to seawater uh, locale. And again, variety of materials, um, uh, uh, Mount Jasper Rhyolite from Berlin, New Hampshire, um, and then some more Monsungan Lake Chert. Uh, another area um, down in Ferrisburg, uh, near here, on uh, what would have been sort of an island landform. You can see that spear point up there. And then another one just across on what would have been a peninsula. And again, these are approximate because we could only map the Champlain Sea um, uh, precisely at its maximum. Uh, so through time, the Champlain Sea is getting shallower, and perhaps you know uh, things were only underwater at high tide or you know um, at, at uh, king tides, or you know it becomes a little bit approximate. Um, so these aren't you know perfectly drawn lines uh, because things were in flux through time, but you can get a general proximity to the Champlain Sea. Uh, the Reagan site in the next following sub-period, again on an island-like landform uh, up in, the, in East Highgate. And I, I, when I, was, I did my master's uh, principally on that site, and the landowner at the time told me he was burying a huge boulder that was in his lawn that he just found unsightly, and he was, he was uh, so borrowed a backhoe and was digging a huge hole in his lawn just because he wanted to roll the boulder in it and then cover it over. And um, he said when he got about eight feet down, it was just nothing but shell, just a huge shell bed from the Champlain Sea. Mm -hmm. um, the next sub-period, and then the final sub-period, you can finally begin to see um, that now um, these dots are encroaching upon the margins of the Champlain Sea because the Champlain Sea is getting shallower. Um, it's becoming probably at this point, it's probably brackish, becoming uh, on its way to becoming fresh, and, and the land was becoming exposed. And so the only thing that's probably still too dynamic to live on are the accumulating river deltas, the, the Missisquoi Delta, the Winooski Delta, and the Lamoille Delta. And everything else was probably habitable, and we saw people moving out onto those landforms. So, in, in aggregate, we see a very close correspondence between Paleo-Indian sites and the Champlain Sea. We also see uh, Paleo-Indian sites on uh, near glacially formed uh, ponds and lakes. Uh, you know, um, Bristol Pond, Moncton Pond, Lake Salem, Shelburne Pond, um, which would have probably been important sources of fresh water, perhaps uh, areas of emergent um, sort of wetland or muskeg-like environments that would have been important places for, for waterfowl or for um, you know, uh, different kinds of animals. And then finally, 
uh, we see Paleo-Indian sites and travel corridors. And uh, toward that end, you know, it, we're very limited in what we can study about the Paleo-Indian period. It's principally, except for the very rarest uh, discoveries of bone throughout the region, the only thing that is, is left is, is stone, and so we're limited in what we can study and how we can study it. And, uh, you know, archaeologists are pretty uh, uh, clever in figuring some things out, and one of them was that, well, um, you know, we know where the sources of this stone have come from. We've tested this a variety of different ways using a lot of uh, petrographic and chemical analyses. And so we can ask, uh, you know, the computer through GIS modeling, you know, what would be the best way, for instance, um, to get uh, from um, the Mahanite in Williston to one of these quarries, and let's say the Monsungan Lake Quarry in, in, in Maine. So uh, my colleagues John and Weatherby and I ran a uh, what's called a weighted cost surface analysis using a lot of different factors, one being slope, but a, you know a lot of different ones, and said to to uh, you know this program, well, what would be the easiest way, given all those parameters, uh, for one to get to from the Mahan site in Williston to the Munsungan Lake uh, Chirp Quarry in Maine, and um, you know. There is an interior route that was sort of highlighted in green, but by far the easiest route would have been um, along the Champlain Sea itself, up into to, uh, you know, what's now Southern Quebec, and then taking uh, what is now uh, the Etchemin River into the West Branch of Penobscot, and then uh, to Monsungan Lake. And what that said to us was that it looks like Paleo-Indians are probably utilizing the resources of the Champlain Sea uh, for food. Um, you know, maybe not whales, but perhaps seals, perhaps fish, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, mussels and, and other things. But they were also using it for, for transportation. Perhaps they made uh, boats of some kind. Large wood to make canoes uh, would have been very scarce, but you could make hide boats, much like people in the Arctic do today. This is a picture of that. Or conversely, they could have gone on the ice in winter. We know that um, uh, it's either harbor or wind seals, of which there's a number of uh, uh, fossil incidences in the Champlain Sea, only rear their pups on, on land fast ice. Uh, similarly, narwhals really require um, uh, you know, uh, land fast ice uh, or steady ice um, as, as part of their um, you know, feeding and, and well-being. So, you know, much like Arctic people did today, they might have waited till the winter and, and uh, crossed by foot or perhaps used uh, dog sleds or other means of transportation like that. So, you know, summarizing that portion, I, I would just say that, uh, you know, the Vermont and the, in the Champlain Valley in New York are really unique um, testing grounds or laboratories to understand the Paleo-Indian period because our beaches have been rising since the Paleo-Indian period, since the end of the Champlain Sea. And we're not already developed on, and they're prime landforms for development, so a lot of them have been, um, preserve this beachfront record. Whereas um, on the Atlantic side, the continental shelf, which we know Paleo-Indians were out doing stuff, has covered by you know hundreds of feet of water now, making it very, very difficult to study what they were doing, how they were interacting with the sea. So currently, until we developed you know, the next, next generation of ROVs and, and drones and you know, things like that, uh, we have this um, sort of area best suited to studying these early life ways and how they um, you know, interacted with their marine environments. So archaic period, I've only got two slides here. I don't even know where I'm at, but. Um, um, but I did want to show uh, the sister site, uh, Chimney Point, um, right here. And um, it, um, as the, the Champlain Sea receded, became Lake Champlain like we know it today, we can see that Native people were very rapidly utilizing those newly exposed landforms. The Champlain Sea would have been underwater until the very last stages of, I mean, I'm sorry, the ch um, Chimney Point would have been under uh, water until the very last stages of the Champlain Sea. Um, but very quickly after it gets exposed, we see the next sort of phase that archeologists um, uh, identify called the early archaic. Uh, we see um, uh, sites or, or 
evidence of people out there, you know, as early as 9,000 years ago. And um, they were quickly adapting to the resources of this um, sort of newly emerging lake and river environment. Uh, we see uh, at the uh, uh, Johns Bridge site um, in Swanton, uh, the earliest evidence of, of fish uh, use, procurement, and probably eating in Vermont around 9,000 years ago, catfish. Uh, we see technologies like these um, fish uh, knives um, emerging right around the same time. So as fish are repopulating the rivers and the lakes, uh, people are rapidly developing technologies to take advantage of these newfound resources. So I'm going to skip roughly the next 6,000 years or, or so. Uh, this was a time of, uh, you know, the, the, that 6,000 year period was the time of hunter-gatherer fishers. Um, the Vermont, the environment became much more stable, although, you know, not completely uniform. There are pulses of slightly warmer and slightly colder, slightly wetter, slightly drier periods. Um, but in general, uh, it was a time when uh, Native people were becoming uh, increasingly adept at utilizing the myriad resources around them for, for uh, you know, um, clothing, for food, for medicine, for, for uh, transport, and intimately understanding all of, uh, all of you know, the different environmental niches in the state. So, just briefly, the, the early woodland period around 3,000 to 2,000 years ago, uh, begins to see a, 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 what environmental proxies uh, tell us is a, is a, is a change in the, in the prevailing environmental regime. Um, you know, there's a, archaeologically and geologically, we can see a lot of things, uh, or environmentally, happening around 2,000 years, 2,800 years ago across the world. Um, you know, various cultures go into decline or collapse. Um, you know. Um, there's weird things that are going on environmentally, and people are still trying to understand that. But we see echoes of that happening around this time in uh, Eastern North America. Um, in Vermont, populations, if you, if you, which is a very coarse sort of metric, but we see archeological sites get fewer, and the sites themselves get smaller, um, indicating that, you know, however, approximately, population size are probably decreasing. We don't know why. Perhaps people were moving out. Perhaps population, you know, the carrying capacity of the environment was just such that people didn't have big families or death was more pronounced. We're not, we're not quite sure, but it does seem to be the case, not only in, in Vermont, but Maine, where I've scrutinized uh, equivalent data and, and, you know, impressionistically elsewhere in the Northeast. But conversely, uh, we see a rise of the first sort of, um, uh, you know, huge multi-regional exchange in non-utilitarian goods. So I'm an advocate during the Paleo-Indian period that people probably were exchanging stone as gifts, uh, as a means of solidifying social bonds. Perhaps the stones had special meanings to them, reminded them of different places. Um, perhaps they were used to honor um, uh, specific types of game. Um, but that was very... Um, probably reciprocal, small scale, and those, those tools in most cases, or those stones were in most cases turned into tools. Beginning in the, in the around 3,000 years ago, we can see that people were um, exchanging all sorts of materials that were not meant to be turned into everyday goods. Copper from the Great Lakes and from Nova Scotia that was turned into beads and bracelets and um, uh, sort of chest uh, plates. Um, uh, Pipestone from um, various parts of the mid-continent and Ohio Valley that were turned into the first smoking pipes we see in the archaeological record in this region. Um, Galena, uh, or lead ore that was turned into a sort of paint, uh, we think as sort of um, body adornment or a, a paint for, for different sort of sacred items. Um, lithic materials, but that weren't destined to be your everyday spear point, but that were often made into very, very large um, ceremonial, what we call hypertrophic or exaggerated blades, um, some of which come all the way from northern Labrador and Rama Bay. And then shell, 
that were also turned into various items of adornment from the Gulf Coast and, and uh, Mid-Atlantic, particularly the Delmarva Peninsula. And elsewhere, um, you know, uh, we have evidence of uh, fossil shark's teeth, um, uh, other items being circulated that would have been worn or displayed in some way. Um, and, you know, depending upon how you look at the data, uh, I, I'm a Vermont-centric guy, so you can see that, you know, in a, in a certain way, a number of these uh, trade corridors have come through the Champlain Valley. Um, a lot of these uh, we see end up as uh, grave goods and Native American burials from this time, which I won't show um, out of respect to those Native groups. Um, but there's a few that, have, uh, that I've come across um, in recent years from non-burial context. For instance, this sort of ceremonial blade made from, again, Rama shirt in northern Labrador, and you can tell by the shape and the, and, the, and the basal morphology that it dates to this early woodland period that was found um, along the Missisquoi River in Berkshire. And it's difficult to judge by the scale, but it's like this big, mm -hmm. and it's like that wide. And when you hold it up to the light, it's like completely translucent. It's, it's wow. just absolutely remarkable. Mm -hmm. And this um, copper axe that was found um, uh, in the, the mud of Lake Salem a number of years ago, um, that uh, because it was in an anaerobic environment, is the only copper axe I've ever seen from this time period that's not corroded green with verdigris. It's, it's still you know, much like it was when it was made uh, roughly 3,000, 2,500 years ago. Uh, the early woodland period is also interesting because it's when uh, pottery first began to be made. Um, at, at first, the pottery in this region, at first the pottery was, uh, which we call Venet one, was quite small. Often, you know, the pots were more or less glorified drinking cup size. Um, occasionally bigger, but often like that. And, um, and very fragile. So finding this pottery is, is quite uh, a challenge because it really, a lot of it just eroded and crumbled away. Uh, but occasionally we do find it in Vermont. And it's characteristic because it's the only time period where they would take fabric um, that they had made, you know, pieces of fabric, wrap it around a dowel or perhaps even their hand, and then impress it into both the exterior and the interior sides of the pot. And that's what you're seeing here. This is what we call fabric paddling, this sort of striated impressions. And my late colleague, Charlie Paquin, who's, who some of you uh, m might have known, um, he, he, he's what we call an experimental archaeologist. And he, he did a, an extended study where he tried to make um, this Vinette Lawn pottery using uh, only the materials and means that Native people would have had 3,000 years ago, with some exceptions. Uh, he used five gallon buckets to get clay. <laughs> he wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't going the full, but he went pretty far. He, was, he went farther than I thought he would. And, and he had a number of revelations that, that came out of this, principally that it is really hard to make pottery in Vermont. There were no kilns here. This was open fire um, uh, pot, you know, um, uh, firing. And so you needed a lot of hardwood. I mean, he said the amount of wood he had to collect, um, and he didn't chop down trees or use axes. He tried to collect dead wood like they would have usually done. Um, was just an overwhelming task. Um, yes, he was doing it alone or occasionally with a, with a helper, but it took him a long time. And what he discovered was he needed that amount of wood to keep the fire burning long enough and hot enough uh, to really solidify the pot. And so what he, the correlation was, you weren't ever just gonna do this to make one pot. When you were doing it, you'd probably make a dozen or more because otherwise it was just a total waste of effort. He also you know, um, came up with you know, things that they might very well have done. Like he waited for a windy night and then tried to channel the wind into the fire to really get it to flame up. And he said, you know, when he became really good at it, you could see, here's a picture of it. You can see the interior of the pots incandesce at different um, colors, depending upon how hot they were. And he really got good at looking like, oh, this is gonna be good because it's, it's the perfect color. And he, you know, hypothesized, uh, he was not native himself, but he hypothesized that you know, this would have probably been, you know, a pretty ceremonial or cosmologically important event that, you know, you're creating essentially something out of dirt uh, that's durable and it's glowing. And this, this probably, you know, had some, um, uh, you know, important social and perhaps sacred overtones to it when you're doing this. 
And you know, my late uh, mentor and, and, uh, and um, colleague, Jim Peterson, also, uh, you know, among other ar archaeologists, would take like um, modeling clay and press into the fragments of this Vinet One pottery. And then you could peel it off, and you could actually see um, the positive impressions of this fabric. And I am not very good at this at all, but he could be like, oh, that's a closed, warped twine, double weave, you know. And you, over time, looking at a number of, of examples, or you know, hundreds of examples, you could, you could actually get um, and understand sort of the universe of, of weaving and twining techniques that Native people were using. Um, things that were essentially archaeologically invisible until pottery becomes around, because organically, except under the rarest circumstances, um, organic materials just don't preserve in Vermont or much of the Northeast soil. So again, really, um, really, um, you know, using innovative techniques to, and a lot of synthesis of disparate uh, data sets across the region to tr try to understand things more holistically. Um, all right, I think I'm all right. So uh, another thing that we look at is um, food and environment, and I'll, I'll just you know go through this quickly. But um, as many of you know, uh, Vermont has sort of a um, today has sort of a tripartite um, forest regime, where where you um, or environmental regime, which is based on altitude uh, principally. Um, this is a, a paper from Sycama in 1970, but basically uh, below around 1,800 feet, we have you know deciduous or mixed forest where we see you know the, the lovely trees turning color and, and uh, a variety of tree species, and then above about uh, 1,800 feet, we have you know um, boreal or, or, or coniferous dominated species, and then very at the highest uh, tops of the Green Mountains, we have. Um, sort of a remnant arctic tundra. And, you know, essentially, in one way to think about it is if you're hiking up, let's say, Camel Sump or Mount Mansfield, in a way, you're sort of going through time. You're hiking up through the modern day deciduous forest that populated this region in the last, you know, eight, nine thousand years ago, getting up into the, into the you know, coniferous, you know, uh, forest that would have been here from 9,000 to about 12,000 years ago, or you know, slowly infilling through time, and then at the top, you're essentially getting what it would have looked like in the early Paleo-Indian period. Um, and it's just something to think about because Native people, closer to time during the Woodland period, certainly would have utilized all these landscapes for various reasons and, and to get various uh, things that they needed or, or, or wanted. Just a view from the top of Camel's Hump. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but um, this uh, Charles Cogbill and his colleague Thompson did this remarkable study where um, they uh, looked at witness trees, which are trees that when, a, when in the first lots that were formed in any particular area or most areas of New England, uh, prior to you know, um, you know, the building of rock walls that really solidified in your lot and stuff like that, they would, they would go to the town and say, well, my lot is defined by um, this particular chestnut tree in the corner, in this corner of my lot, and this particular tree in the other corner of my lot. And then you would try not to cut those down because they marked your, your boundaries. <laughs> and um, they went through, I think it was 701 colonial townships across New England, and basically just said, oh, this guy said he had a chestnut. This person said uh, he had a maple. And then aggregated all that data to basically understand what, um, the forest cover would have looked like at the first um, time Europeans um, laid it out. And what was really interesting is it's difficult to see in this in this slide, but, but you know, as you know, uh, Vermonters of the past cut down the vast majority of their, their forests in the in the early mid uh, 1800s for um, pasture for for farming of various kinds, principally sheep, um, and then regrew it throughout the late 1800s, 1900s. And what you can see here is this dark red here is beech predominant forests. And then in southern New England, the yellow is oak. And then you can see what's regrown since the late 1800s is just maple dominant all the way through. So what we see is, is that um, here's just a, a, a chart of this in, in Vermont. 
But what, what the upshot is, is the forests uh, that the native people were walking through were not only different in that they were probably much larger uh, and widely spaced trees, but they, the, the, the composition of forests was much different. It was a beach-dominated forest. Fully 36% of the, the study um, says that uh, beach is the predominant tree in, in northern New England, and then maples, spruces, going all the way down. And nut-bearing trees um, uh, you know, uh, were very much in the minority. Butternut is way down here. And chestnut, uh, particularly in the Vermont area, is uh, very, very rare. So uh, a number of years ago, my colleague Brett and I um, tried to just do some um, impressionistic look at um, what people were eating by looking at um, the uh, analyzing in close detail basically organic remains trapped in fire pits, um, running it through cheesecloth and fine, fine mesh, recovering the tiny bits of charred remains, having them professionally analyzed, and then looking at what they were eating and what they were burning. And you know, these are not statistically um, you know, uh, calculated. These are more just incidences. Um, but you know, impressionistically, beech does seem to be the predominant wood species being burned in almost every 1,000-year slice from about um, 5,000 years ago uh, up into European contact. And really interesting, you know, what we learned through this is that um, uh, organic remains do not preserve after about 5,000 years ago, even if they're burned, only really, really rarely. Um, we're getting better at looking at more and more microscopic bits of stuff. Um, so, you know, we might, through technology, overcome some of this obstacle, but it, it's, it's uh, preservation is not kind in Vermont. Uh, here are the predominant uh, edible nut species in Vermont that, that Native people utilized. And we can see, again, largely just through incidents, but butternut is by far the, uh, the predominant species in every um, thousand year time slice. And uh, butternut trees were really rare relative to beech, and yet beech is constantly uh, underrepresented. I'm allergic to nuts, so I've never eaten uh, any nuts, but maybe beech nuts is really gross. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm sure there's a nutritional um, and, uh, aspect to this as well. Uh, butternuts are really high in fat, and particularly during the winter months, fat was really important as a, as a store of energy, and so you can process nuts and render them into oils and other things that you can preserve long term. So I'm sure they were quite important in that way, but it's just interesting to see some of this data. And then um, cultigens. Um, uh, through and you know the aggregation of data, nothing has um, sort of bucked the what we have seen archaeologically at least since the last 50 years that corn, beans, and squash really only begin to be grown in Vermont until a, uh, about a thousand uh, years ago. So about a thousand AD up until and beyond European contact. But other plants we've seen recently were grown, um, you know, uh, purposely, uh, intentionally prior to that. <laughs> We have uh, sunflower that was being grown about 2,500 years ago that, that came out up in, up in Swanton along Route 78. Uh, gourd or squash as well, that was likely edible squash, um, as opposed to growing them just for containers or fish weight or fish floats, which we know native people utilize. Um, um, and kinopodium or an edible uh, 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 seed, also called goosefoot. So the last period, and we're going to get back to Mount Independence here a little bit, um, is, is again uh, this what we call the late woodland period. And defined most notably by the, by the uh, adoption of corn bean squash agriculture. And it's interesting that it, that it, it took so long, or, uh, or it, it arrived so late here in Vermont, and and in one sense, um, that might have been because um, it took a long time to hybridize corn varieties that could grow uh, in this um, environment. We are right on the edge still today, even with you know, Monsanto and, and genetic engineering, what can be grown uh, in, in, in uh, many parts of Vermont, particularly northern Vermont. Um, and so you needed to hybridize varieties that could stand that short growing season and, and, and cold weather. But also, I like to think, or I imagine, and I, I've seen, you know, try to aggregate data towards this, that people just didn't really want to. I mean, you know, 
uh, Vermont was a was a pretty bountiful place uh, to get what you needed through um, you know hunter gathering and fishing, and that there needed to be a compelling reason to sort of change what you're you've been doing for the last ten thousand years and uh, you know give over to to staying in sedentary villages for these <coughs> three seasons, uh, planting, harvesting, processing, storing. Um, all this stuff was a radical, uh, you know, lifeway change, and we don't know why they eventually adopted it in 1000 AD or not. But I can imagine that there was some resistance for quite a long time. This is just an early uh, depiction of uh, the Iroquois growing corn, and unlike um, the Iroquois neighbors to uh, the west, uh, native people in Vermont, as far as we can tell archaeologically thus far, never fully moved into a four-season village environment. They, uh, as far as we can understand, they got together after, um, you know, uh, corn, bean, squash uh, agriculture became dominant, uh, many of them anyway, for, for three season, get, get together in the spring, um, plant, uh, monitor the harvest, um, you know, celebrate together, that, or monitor the crop, then harvest, then store, and then probably break off in the winter into smaller family units. And Pete Thomas, uh, an archaeologist uh, working for a long time in Vermont, came up with this diagram, which might be a little bit hard to read, but basically these are the, are the months of the year, spring, summer, fall, winter, and then the blue is when things were being utilized. So in the spring, shad and salmon runs, um, and then, you know, non-anadromous fish later in the summer, um, you know, uh, opportunistic beet, you know, nuts and berries and, and plants. Then in the, in the fall, maize comes in, um, then deer hunting, then bear, then moose, and, and around we go. Um, this is a quote uh, that was in an 1828 book by Daniel Clark Sanders, one of the first presidents of UVM. And uh, what he had seen in, in decades earlier along the intervale, And just quickly, because I know we're running out of time, but we see um, one of the biggest archaeological excavations done to date in Vermont was done in advance of the still not built uh, widening of Route 78 in Swanton. Uh, this was done over a decade ago. Um, and this is, if you imagine this being over here, this is one long um, you know, uh, corridor that was tested where where the, the route is gonna be expanded. So a very limited corridor along the edges of the existing roadway. And um, what they found, but, but um, you know, very extensive native archeological deposits. And what the archeologists found, Northeast Archeology span Research Center, was that this is towards Swanton Village uh, uh, East, and this is West. And what they found is through time, um, this is the middle archaic, so like six to 7,000 years ago, one little blip, one little, little spot they found. And then through time, the orange show up a little bit, then yellow gets slightly bigger and further out onto the delta. And then beginning around 2000 years ago, the blue, which is what we call the middle woodland period, just blows up and sites become very, very dense. A lot of people living there. And then the green is really pushing much farther out into the dent delta, getting more extensive still, and probably indicates that all of this area was being used as uh, cornfields and that they were living quite close to the river. Um, just very dense archaeological deposits. And as, as Helen talked about, you know, generally deeper is older. The same thing with flood deposits, all other things being equal. Um, these, all these dark strata are all um, uh, what we call anthrosols or human-induced dark soils. Um, and they just go down and down and down and down and down all different episodes of occupation through time. The first uh, longhouse was found uh, up here on Route 78. It wasn't fully exposed. Um, and in fact, uh, because it was on federal land, the, the federal government said, well, you can map it, but you can't really dig it. So they, they took down the plow zone. Um, you can see this line, this post mold line here, then a turn. This is part of the other one. Um, and then all these in here are fire pits both inside and outside of the structure. Um, I'll just play this. This is sort of a three-dimensional reconstruction of what it might have looked like. Mm -hmm. 
Longhouses uh, were multifamily units and they were segmented. So each uh, segment, depending upon how long it was, was how many family units you could fit in there. And they would each have a fire in the middle. Here's the, the, the midden or the trash pit related to that longhouse, which is just you know, episode after episode of dumping, dumping, dumping. Uh, maize remains came out of that, abundant maize, and we got a number of radiocarbon dates from them. Oops, what was that? But also wild rice, butternut, acorn, you know, and a variety of wild plant foods. And a lot of, you know, really extraordinary pottery. And then bringing it back to Mount Independence, what we see up here is quartzite, very common in these late woodland um, arrow points that call Levana points. Um, but also this Hathaway chert that outcrops in St. Albans, very near to Swanton, makes some bit of sense. Um, and then I'll just go through very quickly. Um, when we go south, this is on the intervale. Um, this is just a map um, of uh, the intervale. And all of these different colors are the courses of the Winooski River just since 1800. And you can see how much the river's changed. And then these arrows underlying LIDAR point out former river channels. The red are hundreds of years old, and the green are thousands of years old. And um, all of the archaeological sites we know about in the Intervale, are, or almost all of them, are along these, these former river channels. Um, Corn cob site or the Donahue site is the only you know, intact cob that we've recovered of corn in, in Vermont thus far, radiocarbon dated to about 1415 AD. And you can see here um, that uh, there's quartzite again, but then this dark uh, um, blackish gray chert is this chert that outcrops out at Mount Independence, at Mount Independence but, but also elsewhere. But at just quickly going through, this is another one further up the river past the falls in South Burlington, right near uh, the Army National Guard uh, airfields. This is a large excavation that took place about 10 years ago. I was in charge of it. Just go through this quickly. Lots of storage pits. We think that we actually are seeing the side of a longhouse here too but we didn't find the post molds because the angle that we were excavating was a little bit difficult. We were, we were just excavating the, where they were gonna wide, widen the road. So in regulatory ar archeology, span we almost always don't excavate where we want to excavate, but where something is gonna be disturbed. Um, but nevertheless, a remarkable site. We see storage pits. And then um, out of 113 of these Levana type spear points, and here's the distribution of them across this area, um, 110 were made from quartzite, but uh, the other three were made out of this um, material um, from down at Mount Independence. Here's a bell shaped um, st um, storage feature for storing corn. It's got this characteristic like this. Um, I'm just going to scroll through. Every radiocarbon date came out to 1315 AD or thereabouts. There's an error, but. Um, this is a, a quote from Peter Kahn in uh, 1741. And elsewhere he says, oh, you know, um, the native people lit those fires to scare up game. But I don't think that's true. I think they were lighting the fires to clear fields um, for, for corn. Um, and we had never had evidence until the last you know, three or four years of uh, actual corn remains in archaeological sites uh, on the Upper Creek. But um, recent dam relicensing, we found about four just on you know, one stretch of the Upper Creek in the Weybridge area. And um, here's just one of these sites. Um, I, I won't labor on the, you know, the intrasite uh, fire pits and features and spatial uh, arrangement. You can see though that this is a very deep sort of bowl shaped feature. It's sort of layered, um, probably filled in or like a refuse pit. Um, lots of uh, characteristic um, late woodland pottery in it, but also um, uh, corn 
um, and a variety of other plant foods. But again, getting back to the late woodland, you see um, it's difficult to see in this slide. But again, a predominance of quartzite, but um, only this um, Mount Independence or you know uh, Southern Champlain Valley chert. And and what I, I I've noticed this. Not only these are just a few examples that I could get good slides for, but I've noticed this in um, almost every site I look at that below the Lamoille River, there's quartzite and there's this dark Mount Independence chert during the late woodland period. And above the Lamoille River, there's quartzite and there's Hathaway chert. And if, the, if everything was totally open and free, and you, you'd see some amount of Hathaway chert down south. So what I'm thinking is there was some sort of ethnic, territorial, some kind of boundary um, that demar roughly demarcated by the Lamoille River. Um, and we're only getting the merest traces of it thus far. I, I'd like to actually you know, make this more robust, um, to look at many more sites and quantify this more regularly, and then look at pottery styles and see if pottery styles are slightly different up, above and below the Lamoille River. And then we can really get to understand you know, maybe some of these um, uh, territorial dynamics not after a European contact when it becomes so, so um, prominent and, and, and conflictual, but, but in, the, in the centuries prior to European contact and, and what that might have meant. And I'll, I'll leave it there, so thanks. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, are roads in Vermont uh, laid down based on ancient trails? It, a lot of them are. I mean, the, the earliest roads, in many, in many cases, yes. But until, you know, about 1850, people start to say, I want my road to go there. And then they just start blasting and cutting and doing whatever they want. Very early on, um, you know, when the technologies, means, population centers, money wasn't available, yeah, they went through the paths of least resistance, which were very often, um, uh, you know, former <coughs> paths, trails. But, you know, it, it needs to be remembered that um, the, the highways of, of Native people were, um, you know, the waterways. And um, you could travel much more efficiently, efficiently by watercraft than you could through overland trails. So, in some cases, you know, um, you know, these paths were discontinuous in areas where you, know, you might, might not have been able to paddle for whatever reason. Um, but yeah. And could that begin to address your question about the boundary that the Lamoille created? Um, no, I mean, I, it's sort of an arbitrary line. It's just where I see it. I don't think, I don't think, um, you know, territoriality and, and um, sort of identification of place is a big topic in archaeology, and 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 uh, you know, people people throughout time and across the world have you know considered their homeland, their place, you know, to be um, you know have certain boundaries or certain extents and identify with certain things, and that that changes through through time. Um, so I don't think there was any physical impediment why people couldn't go north. In fact, the previous period, um, I don't see any of that material differentiation. People seem to have been going up and down the lake and, and going up and down the rivers however they want. Something seems to change is what I'm just seeing in the archaeological record beginning around 1000 AD. And again, this is very impressionistic at this point. I've only noticed it in the last year or two as I see more of these big reports coming in and, and uh, and I'm just like, huh, well that, you know, it's getting to be a, you know, where it's not a coincidence. And, and even and more interesting is quartzite is ubiquitous in both. And quartzite outcrops, you know, there are, you can get big boulders of it almost anywhere in the Champlain Valley. But if you really want to go mine a lot of it, you've got to go to, you know, the, the sort of the western spine of Green Mountains, Moncton, Bristol. Um, and then there's a southern, you know, belt of it too, Mount Tabor, Dorset. Um, uh, but you know, there's big, big uh, um, you know, pre-contact mines in these areas, or, or exposures, quarries, not mines, quarries, um, and um, and 
we don't see any lack of quartzite anywhere. So people seem to have been able to go along the Green Mountains, you know, and get what they needed, but they just don't seem to have been able to go to those quarries, you know, if you're if you're above or below a certain area. So it's a, it's a it's a little bit of a you know tr still trying to think that out. Perhaps they were they you could go where you wanted, but you couldn't take stone from one of these other areas. Perhaps you know it, it uh, they were protected in some way. They were they were mythologized in some way. I'm not, I'm not sure. Can you tell them about the Heritage Center? Oh yeah. So um, the Vermont Archaeology Heritage Center is. Uh, is um, sort of a cure, its principal um, role is as a curation space for um, uh, uh, collections derived from archaeological sites that have been excavated um, in Vermont in a professional way, principally um, regulatory archaeology, prior to some disturbance. We're rapidly running out of space, but uh, we curate you know, collections from um, you know, eight, over 800 archaeological sites, well over a million artifacts. Many of those artifacts aren't things that people would necessarily be interested in, but um, a lot of them are. Um, and I'm there usually um, Tuesdays and Thursdays up in Barrie, uh, at 60 Washington Street. We have a small amount of exhibit space that oh, actually over this winter my colleagues in VTrans and I want to revamp the, the, uh, the uh, exhibits and have some new stuff. So. Yeah, um, if you want to send me an email and come up and visit sometime, please do. So when you go to do your research at the uh, library for the Oh Historical yeah, I'm in the same Society. building. Same yep. building. Just come and say hi. Yeah. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Jess. Um, I've heard, in, in particular in relation to the mouth, that the native peoples, you're talking about the church areas, native peoples worked the edges of the church. And when the whites came in, they started working right in the middle of the turd outcroppings. Have you have any comments? Well, I mean, I, I think a lot of it depends upon the underlying geology. Um, you know, <laughs> definitely in other in other areas. Um, well, like quartzite. Quartzite is so hard. Um, you know, it, it, and uh, that you weren't ever gonna with you know stone be able to you know delve deep. Into you know uh, into the into the stone itself you know develop a an adit or a stope to go in and get stuff you had to work the edges because it was just too hard but we know of other areas um, you know over in, uh, in 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 New York in um, in uh, New Hampshire where they were I mean not to you know not tens of feet deep but they were you know trying to follow the contours of the best highest quality, most nappable stone mm -hmm. into the stone. Um, I think the, the part with Mount Independence is that, and perhaps what the Revolutionary War people didn't know, is that this chert is nodular. So you can try to go in as much as you want, but eventually you're going to hit the parent material because it's, it's just bowling ball sized stuff. Or big, you know, occasionally bigger. But, you know, you could dig as deep as you wanted and you're never going to hit a big vein of it because it's not a chart that's in bed or beds or veins. It's it's nodular. So yeah, you wanted to expose stuff on the surface. I mean, you know, the, you know, the you didn't want to expend more labor than you needed to. And I have a feeling that thousands of years ago there was a lot more surface exposure mm -hmm. that people were just, you know, expending minimal effort to get out. And then it sort of got played out and you know the, the exposures became more you know, smaller. And then, you know, I, I really, we do see like um, little flake scatters, like, uh, you know, almost preserved, like someone sat down, you know, a thousand years ago and bashed it off the, off the cliff face and then sat there and made like a biface to transport away right there. We see like almost just the flake scatter around, bigger ones than smaller ones as they're working it down more. Um, you know, we've seen a few of those over the years where just like someone was sitting there yesterday. Yeah. Um, which is really, really neat. But we haven't seen a lot of, um, you know, big spalling debris from the Revolutionary War stuff on the church side. So I don't, I don't know where, you know, Matt Bullinger and Alan Hathaway, they wrote a paper quite a while back where they, they found documentation that they were shipping, you know, cartloads of, of this church um, away to try to make it into gun flints. I doubt it was very successful. Yeah, there were orders issued. Anybody knows how to map flint, uh, <laughs> you know, to 
come over here and right. work this church trying to get gunpoints out of it. I'm, yeah, it's not I, the best stuff for a gun. Point. No, it's it's not the best stuff for making spear points either. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. it's it, it's not a super high grade material, but they were probably psyched to have it relative to quartzite. Quartzite is once you get it into its shape, it's extremely strong and it maintains an edge for a long time. But getting it into its shape is very, very from from everything that my expert flint expert friends talk about. Like most of them, you know won't even work it anymore because they're like, nope, that gave me, you know, tennis elbow, that gave me carpal tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> they just won't do it. Uh, so. so clearly we have to have Jess come back again sometime. I hope you will. So um, I we probably should move on to the next, yes. although I hate that. But thank no, you thank so you. much, Jess. That was just great.